Uh, thank you, Professor McDonald, for that lovely introduction. Uh, so first, welcome to the guests of the college, our friends and community members. Thank you for joining us today. Before we start, we'd like to thank our professors, Professor McDonald, Professor Goddard, Professor McAllister, and our TA Jack Greenberg for their tremendous assistance with this project. I'm Christine Tamir, and I'm the group leader of China A. Our team consists of Coley Elhai, regional expert, Henry Liu, our expert on military matters, and Mandela Namaste, our expert on economics. So the U.S.-China relationship is incredibly valuable to both nations, the world at large and the Asia-Pacific region. Both of our nations are important to the global financial order, and we are both significant trade partners to the other. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the U.S. exported over $42.3 billion in trade to China and imported over $137 billion of Chinese goods in 2016. There's also a huge amount of trade that goes through the South China Sea in general. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, $5.3 trillion of trade goes through the sea each year, with $1.2 trillion of it being U.S. trade. And in addition to being economically significant, Sino-American relations are generally positive. In recent years, the U.S. and China have taken steps to build a positive relationship. We have negotiated trade treaties, such as the U.S.-China Relations Act of 2000, which normalized trade relations and led to China joining the World Trade Organization the following year. In 2013, President Obama hosted Xi Jinping at the Sunnyland Summit in an effort to reframe U.S.-China relations to emphasize cooperation and ease tensions. Both countries recognize that they have more to gain from China's rise if relations are smooth. This largely beneficial relationship is complicated uh, by tensions which arise from Chinese insecurity, such as competing territorial claims in the South China Sea. However, these territorial claims have been in existence since the World War II era and will not be resolved simply through U.S. influence. China's claiming of islands as military posts in the South China Sea have not, nor do they, pose a threat to the security of the U.S., the Philippines, or Vietnam. These military outposts are largely symbolic. They are intended to project Chinese military power, but in reality tend to be vulnerable. So we know that China wouldn't risk outright conflict from these islands. But the question then becomes why China engages in such assertive regional territorial claims. The answer to that lies in insecurity-driven Chinese nationalism, which is inflamed by hawkish U.S. actions in the region. This nationalism means that China will claim whatever islands it deems necessary to prove, both at home and abroad, that it determines its own course without bending to the will of an external, foreign, Western power. It should be noted that China's nationalism comes from a defensive posture. These actions coming from a position of secure insecurity based on the past century of are also based on the past century of humiliation as well. Not only is this nationalism defensive in nature, it is limited in scope. The current Chinese government also curbs nationalism because it fears that excessive nationalism will lead to its overthrowing. Now, many U.S. policymakers have framed assertive Chinese actions in the South China Sea as a threat to our freedom of trade and freedom of commercial navigation, which is done out of a misunderstanding of the motivations of Chinese actions. China doesn't seek to undermine the international order because of the benefits it receives. We can peacefully resolve these conflicts. Uh, without resorting to force or endangering bilateral relations. The U.S. should realize that, recognize that China doesn't pose a serious threat to our core real interests. For instance, China does not want to undermine freedom of commercial navigation, a practice from which it sees tremendous benefits. In a similar vein, it does not make sense to assume that China wants to threaten freedom of navigation because it gains in, um, intelligence and security from its own patrols. Pursuing an assertive policy in the South China Sea would undermine our interests. First, it would endanger our bilateral relations with China because the U.S. would force China into a cornered position where it is more likely to lash out. A policy of forward deployment would also get the U.S. In involved in a war that simply does not promote our own interests. Therefore, we propose a policy which promotes a mutually beneficial relationship between China and the U.S., which we will achieve through calculated restraint and enhanced engagement. Coley will present our plan to improve regional uh, ties by outlining policies that promote trust and cooperation between the U.S. and China, prevent accidental indiv individual naval encounters from escalating, and promote regional stability. She will lay out our plan for a multilateral forum to empower the region to resolve conflicts. 
Henry will explain how our current military strategy in the South China Sea leads to our unwanted scenario, and will present our policy of calculated restraint to empower our rules-based diplomatic solution. And finally, Mandela will discuss our plan to integrate China into the liberal international order by using economic agreements and bilateral negotiations to address common economic interests of both China and the US. And now I'll pass the presentation to Coley. Thank you, Christine. As Christine elaborated, the US-China relationship is a very important one for United States security and prosperity. But so too is the United States' relations with Southeast Asia as a whole. It's a region full of opportunity for the United States, something that the Obama administration's pivot to Asia was in recognition of. The region's power and importance are rising, thanks in large part to the tremendous economic growth in the region. There are promising opportunities for American investment and trade, which means that there's also a significant American interest in stability. Stability allows us to focus on engaging with the region in more productive directions rather than trying to focus on putting out fires wherever they occur. There has been promising uh, positive progress in terms of regional cooperation um, in the 2000s. There's an agreement in 2002, 2004, 2006, but that there was a significant increase in tensions following the militarization that came with the United States pivot to Asia. Following the pivot in 2012, there is a, 2012 was one of the most controversial years in the region. There is the Scarborough Shoal standoff, one of the worst in the region in years, um, as well as increased um, uh, disputes over who owned the, Scar the Spratleys, the Paracels, Vietnam passed a law asserting that they belonged to them, as well as China stationing its first military garrison in the South China Sea in the same year. It's against this backdrop of increased tensions that we target our regional policy to achieve several goals. The first of these is conflict management. Given the number of vessels in the region, the number of countries that, that lay claim to its waters, it's inevitable that there are certain run-ins between fishing vessels, shipping vessels, the like. But we want to prevent these individual level conflicts from escalating into greater ones between nations rather than individuals. We also want to decrease tensions by building trust. So what reflects these tensions is the increase in military spending over the past a decade or so. China has ramped up its military spending and its neighbors have reciprocated. So other nations with claims, including Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, the Philippines, and Taiwan, have almost doubled their military spending over the past decade to total $30.4 billion. We want to reverse this militarization trend by decreasing the perceived need for defense. And lastly, we want to promote long-term stability by empowering the region to work together to resolve its issues rather than having the United States have to step in wherever, wherever conflict arises. The best way to achieve these goals is through enhanced engagement and calculated restraint. The first part of this is we propose ratifying the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, this will not, substitute as a, this will not constitute a substantive change in our policy since the United States Navy is already very careful to observe the laws, these laws and its operations, but it will signal the United States commitment to a just resolution of maritime disputes as well as our engagement with the international community and international law. It'll build trust in the United States as a mediator in these disputes, as well as demonstrate to China the universal applicability of these conventions, show that it's not something that only applies to weaker nations that can't defend their claims unilaterally, but rather to powerful nations such as the United States and also China. Second, we propose a new multilateral forum to discuss these claims and disputes in the region. It will include claimants, including China, the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, and Vietnam, as well as interested parties such as the United States, Singapore, and Indonesia, mm -hmm. but not parties more open to manipulation, Cambodia and Laos, which are in, in ASEAN, which has proved a, a valuable ally in the region and an important forum for discussing other, other issues. But in the case of the South China Sea, it has proved unable to make any progress on the issue, thanks in part to Chinese pressuring of Laos and Cambodia, and because of ASEAN's uh, need for unanimity in passing resolutions and, making, and taking action. So the United States, in line with calculated restraint, will not dominate the conversation in this new forum, since the primary purpose for this new forum is allowing nations to more meaningfully engage with these issues, to solve them on, on their own, and to build trust between them. And so some argue that China will simply not agree to such a forum, since China has, it's true, in the past been opposed to multilateral uh, discussions on these claims. 
but we believe that the recent ruling in The Hague changes the balance of incentives for China. We believe that rather than waiting for the international courts to rule on more cases against China and for, the, for international respect, for China to lose some of its international standing, we believe that China will choose instead to take a more active role in resolving these issues on its own terms. And this new forum will give it an opportunity to do this without openly acquiescing to the West or the international community. This forum will also give nations an opportunity to engage in cooperation spirals, which is an idea proposed by Lyle Goldstein and involves building trust and cooperation by first discussing less controversial but also mutually beneficial issues. So in the South China Sea, these issues involve counter piracy, uh, environmental protection, and joint development of petroleum resources. So issues that will help all the countries involved while also building trust. Eventually, we will propose for the forum to discuss a new code of conduct, one that na the nations involved will follow and, and result in less conflict overall. Another major area for cooperation is in the expansion of the code for unplanned encounters at sea. This is a code that is already in place, but in a much more limited form than we propose. It currently applies only to military vessels, which it has been helpful so far, but in the South China Sea, a lot of the disputes have come between fishing vessels, um, between trading vessels, and Coast Guard. So we would like to expand these protocols, um, which involve uh, protocols for safety, communications, maneuvering, when vessels meet in an unexpected way, and will also prevent accidents from leading to an escalation of conflicts. So these measures will help us in establishing more stable relations, both between the United States and ASEAN nations, and between China and ASEAN nations. It will also mean that ca uh, catastrophe and escalation are less likely. So it'll be less likely that the United States is pulled in to defend its allies. These states will also be better positioned to engage with each other and with the United States, meaning that there is more opportunity to wo work cooperatively towards internal development. And finally, this, these measures will also lead to a reversal of militarization trends in the region, meaning safer passage for ships through the South China Sea. And so for more on the reversal of militarization trends, I'll invite Henry to speak. Thank you, Coley. The United States is a dominant military power in the Asia Pacific, including in the South China Sea. And in the South China Sea, this military presence supports two key objectives, upholding peace and stability and empowering a rules-based diplomatic solution to the dispute. Given these objectives, the current strategy of a military buildup is counterproductive. We propose a more prudent strategy of calculated restraint. The United States military is dominant in the region. It has a heavy forward presence, strong military partnerships, and its weapon systems outclass and outperform all potential rivals, including China. It will take a very long time if China hopes to catch up. Therefore, the greatest threat to the United States from the region is not that the, US, uh, the Chinese military will somehow push the U.S. out, but rather that the United States and China could precipitate and escalate into an unwanted, unnecessary major military conflict. The risks are real. A misunderstanding, miscalculation, or accident could trigger a crisis. And in a crisis, the U.S. Navy cannot operate effectively without dealing with China's A2AD, its anti-axis air denial capabilities. In other words, the cruise and ballistic missiles China has on land that could threaten U.S. warships at sea. Current U.S. doctrine for dealing with A2AD, called JAMGC, it used to be called air-sea battle, involves striking in land with penetrating missiles and bombers to hit China's missiles, and this also requires blinding Chinese radar. <coughs> What's particularly dangerous, however, is that these U.S. missiles could also carry nuclear warheads, and Chinese radar are also used for nuclear warnings. And more importantly, China has no secure second strike capability. In other words, this U.S. attack would look like a potential nuclear first strike that could also wipe out China's own nuclear arsenal, and this could quickly spiral out of control. As a consequence, any strategy that relies on continued escalation and perpetual brinksmanship is unduly reckless. A primary objective for the United States, therefore, is to maintain peace and stability in the region, but also to empower a rules-based diplomatic solution to the dispute. Given these objectives, the current strategy is counterproductive. The current military buildup calls for 60% of the U.S. Navy and Air Force to be deployed in the region by 2020. In the past four months alone, the United States has sent Marines to Australia. Um, it has opened new bases in the Philippines or announced these, these new bases. It has announced the deployment of the THAAD missile defense system to South Korea. It has lifted a lethal arms embargo to the Vietnam, and it has implicitly supported new army laws in Japan. And this is counterproductive for three reasons. 
First off, a U.S. escalation prompts a Chinese escalation in turn, and escalation is a losing strategy for the United States. China will not back down first because China believes it is escalatory dominance. It has more core interests at stake. It looks at, say, Crimea, where the United States backed down first because Russia had more core interests at stake. And more importantly, even if the Chinese government wanted to back down first, its hands are tied by a domestic population that's increasingly demanding for the government to be more assertive in defending national interests um, in proportion with China's rising power. Second, deploying more warships, more aircraft carriers into an already militarily crowded South China Sea is a recipe for the exact misunderstandings and accidents that the United States is trying to avoid. And a survey at the recent litany of unsafe <coughs> air to air and surface to surface encounters in the region show that this is not a sustainable strategy. And third, the U.S. buildup carries a moral hazard in which it emboldens Vietnam and the Philippines to carry out their own provocations, which creates a strategic liability for the United States that could entrap um, the United States in a war against its own interests. And more importantly, the perception of an external intervener um, in the region would undermine any diplomacy already on the table. This explains why, after the U.S. pivot in 2011, um, exactly as tensions escalated. Um, China sent its military garrison, Philippines and Vietnam passed provocative laws, um, the, South, the Scarborough Shoal dispute, one of the worst in the past 38 years, as described in the previous regional presentation. Um, and since then, tensions have only continued to escalate. So this is not a sustainable strategy. We propose, therefore, a more prudent strategy of calculated restraint with four prongs. The United States should restrict the deployment of more warships, more aircraft carriers, into its already overwhelming surface fleet in, in the region. Um, second, the United States should limit provocative patrols close to China's borders. And we support freedom of navigation operations. For instance, after China declared an air defense identification zone in the East China Sea, and we went right through it. But we caution against too many patrols for their own sake, not in response to any Chinese provocation, but just following a frequent recurring timeline. Um, and third, we, we, the United States should restrict sales of advanced weapon systems uh, to the Philippines and Vietnam and reduce war games and joint patrols in favor of more Coast Guard exercises or search and rescue partnerships, things that don't look like the United States is building anti-China military coalition. And fourth, of course, we support continued military-to-military -military engagements between the United States and China to further develop doctrine for unexpected encounters at sea. Now, some people will lay the appeasement charge to any reduction in the U.S. force posture, and this is mistaken. China is not after unbounded territorial ambitions. Um, South China Sea is a question of resource sharing. China is not going to invade the homeland of the Philippines or Vietnam or Japan. And more importantly, the United States, by sensibly recalibrating its overextended commitments actually increases the credibility of its core commitments to defending the homeland of the Philippines and Japan. And furthermore, practicing a strategy of perpetual brinksmanship in fear of making any concessions is an unsustainable strategy and an increasingly losing strategy as China continues to rise. So in the long term, the United States hopes to maintain its military presence in the Asia Pacific, as it has done in the past 70 years. As China continues to rise, however, it increasingly faces a choice of whether it wants to accept and continue to recognize this U.S. presence or whether it wants to challenge it, which will lead to conflict. The United States can influence this choice by signaling that its military posture isn't offensive in nature, that it isn't aiming at regime change or creating a new anti-China NATO or practicing a Cold War strategy of island chain containment, encirclement, and putting China down. Only this way can we have a sustainable strategy moving forward. As a consequence, we caution against the current military buildup and propose a more prudent strategy of calculated restraint. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mandela um, for the economic presentation. Thank you, Henry. Um, I will start by saying that maritime disputes like the one in the South China Sea should not endanger US-China economic relations. Along this line, U.S. can also use economics to improve our relationship with China. We argue that the U.S. should pursue several economic paths with China, including deep economic engagement in Southeast Asia and bilateral trade relations with China. With that in mind, we are arguing that the U.S. should attempt to continue to integrate China into the liberal world order, providing it with more opportunities to both strengthen its economy and that of Southeast Asia's economy. First, the tensions in the South China Sea are not representative of the whole of Sino-American relations. The economic relationship between the U.S. and China is generally very lucrative and very successful. This relationship has been extremely positive, especially since 2001, the last time China accepted li liberal international protocols, when they joined the WTO, 
the World Trade Organization. To join the WTO, China had to undergo many years of negotiations and its economy went, underwent significant changes, including the liberalization of the service sector, and they were held more accountable for things like transparency and intellectual property rights. These were certainly difficult changes for China. However, since 2001, it's become one of the largest economies in the world and has the second largest, has the second largest economy by GDP and is the third largest merchandise exporter and second largest importer. All of these figures continue to rise uh, since China's ascent into the WTO. All that being said, repeated Sino-American tensions over the South China Sea have been a major fracture in the relationship between the U.S. and China, and more economic integration into the liberal world order is a way to revitalize this important and special relationship. We have several suggestions in this vein. First, the United States should ratify the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. An American repudiation of the TPP is a signal to the Asian countries in that organization that the U.S. is unwilling to back them in standing up to China, weakening American claims in the region, and essentially showing an American surrender to Chinese hegemony. However, China has perceived the TPP as anti-China, and an American signature on the partnership could alarm Beijing. There has been some internal American backlash regarding another international free trade agreement, especially with the current presidential candidates, but the TPP will provide a large boost to the American economy, both at home and abroad. The U.S. can use economic tools to salvage this potentially disastrous situation by starting negotiations on a new bilateral free trade agreement between the U.S. and China. This agreement would lower tariffs for Chinese exports to the U.S. It doesn't have to be signed right away, but the process of showing negotiations and a show of good faith is a show of good faith that the U.S. is willing to work with China. Adding to this, the U.S. should speed up talks with China on a bilateral investment treaty. The two countries have been discussing such an agreement as recently as late June. Much of the content of these talks is currently secret, but in late May, China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, stated that he wants the U.S.-China BIT to include guiding principles for foreign investment policies. Such a policy would improve China's economy and help improve both trade cooperation and Sino-American relations. As a final olive branch, and perhaps maybe something a little bit more controversial, the U.S. should open itself to negotiations regarding its entrance to the AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It benefits both the existing members of the AIIB and the U.S. if both sides are able to reach an agreement on an American presence in the bank. The United States in joining the AIIB would benefit greatly, solidifying its financial influence in Asia, limiting China's voting power in the bank, integrating the AIIB with existing major multilateral banks like the World Bank, and doing many other positive projects. The U.S. has also shown concern regarding some environmental and social safeguards, as well as administrative standards in the region. While, all, in, while in the past, they've also discouraged allies like the United Kingdom and Australia from joining the AIIB. However, this kind of action is in the immediate interest of the United States, and we encourage the U.S. to be pragmatic. This is a pivotal decision that is in our best interest, and we urge American policymakers to seriously consider the strategic benefits afforded by joining the AIIB. Some might say that China may refuse these offers based on political viewpoints, but a nightmare scenario in which the American offers are rejected has little chance of happening. It is heavily, heavily in China's economic self-interest to agree to these proposals, and China has agreed to similar proposals, like the uh, entrance into the WTO outlined earlier. The many opportunities for trade and multilateral cooperation presented here will amount to sums of money that would make the Chinese economy very, very strong for the foreseeable future. We recommend that the U.S. pursue policies of enhanced economic engagement. My proposals reflect these overarching goals. We want to be involved with China's economy. We want them to work with us and trust us so we can work together to ease tensions. The economic actions that the U.S. takes now will build a successful foundation for prosperous economic relations with China in the long run. I'll hand it over to Christine to finish it. Thank you, Mandela. In developing an approach in the South China Sea, we have to identify what the U.S.'s core interests are. China A has determined that three key interests, the continuation of stable trade relations with China, strengthening our partnership with a rising power, and avoiding unnecessary conflicts because they have high potential to escalate into war, which threatens our vital interests as our key interests. 
And now our policy promotes these interests. Enhanced engagement strengthens both our trade and diplomatic relations with China, and calculated restraint on the part of the US communicates to China that the US is not a threat, and we do not have any intention of undermining their prosperity. But what happens if we were to pursue a, more, uh, a policy of more forward deployment in the South China Sea? Now, this policy would be the result of Cold War mentality and a skewed sense of priorities on the part of the US. This type of policy would feature actions from the US that demonstrate its power in the South China Sea, which would transform our currently positive relationship into one where China is alienated and threatened by the United States. And this alternative policy leads the US down the path of our unwanted scenario, where we've created a capable enemy out of an increasingly powerful China. Not only will we have disrupted our bilateral trade relations with our biggest trading partner and started a war over a conflict that could have been resolved peacefully, but pursuing this type of policy will cause China to be suspicious and mistrust the US. In the vein of President Obama's past remarks, we have more to fear from this weakened, threatened China than one with which we have cultivated a positive relationship with. In the end, policy in the South China Sea should be judged on two premises. One, how likely the policy is to get us into a war in the South China Sea. And second, the precedent that the policy sets for Sino-American relations for years to come. Thank you. Let's open the floor to questions from our experts and distinguished visitors. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, that was very informative. Uh, let me, uh, and let me just say on, on a broad uh, level that uh, you know, it's clear that uh, these trade relations are key to us and, and to our people and that uh, stability in that region is also an essential core interest of ours. So uh, much of what you present here I think uh, uh, I agree with. Uh, let me, let me um, press you on a few points. Um, first of all to Henry. Uh, you know, when you're uh, presenting your recommendation here, you are saying essentially that uh, you know, we believe in freedom of navigation and, uh, you know, there's going to be a U.S. military presence there. You caution against building up uh, uh, further. Um, so, you know, I hear from families all the time who have their sons and daughters that are in the United States military, including the Navy, and they have expressed a, a grave concern to me that we're not doing enough to protect their sons and daughters. Uh, they point out um, this incident that happened in 2009 with the USS Impeccable. Uh, they, they point out the incident, and, and that was key uh, um, because I think that it, it really pointed to a new strategy coming from China. Quite candidly, I have advisors who come to me who don't agree with your timeline. They don't see 2012 as the jumping off point. They don't see this as a reaction. They see really 2009 as a change in, in Chinese policy. So I'll be curious, Christine, in your perspective whether or not, how would you come back to that timeline? But with regard to the military, <coughs> you know, the impeccable, the Calpins, we've had two intercept issues uh, with, um, with EP3 and an EP8, and, and the EP3 incident only happened just a couple months ago. So I, th these families are very active. They come to me, th they're, they're wanting to know what I'm doing, particularly given my background. They said, you know, you're not doing enough to push back on the Obama administration to make sure that we're protecting our sons and daughters. And so, you know, that's a question I have. And then, and then one other is, uh, for Christine, for the leader here, and do you accept uh, Chinese uh, position on the nine dash line? And, and the reason why I'm saying this is that, you know, it appears to me from the other advice I've gotten from advisors that, uh, you know, they, the Ch China has a certain interpretation of what's acceptable in the EEZs that isn't, doesn't comport with uh, UNCLOS. Uh, particularly with regard to military uh, activities, they think that they can dictate that. And so if we move what we all agree is China's territorial waters, if, if we accept the Nine Dash Line, then of course that has impact on our friends and allies. So I'll be interested to know. So that's the first couple copies that I have. Well, thank you, sir. When it comes to protecting American soldiers, the best way to do that is to avoid provoking an unnecessary conflict. And I would argue that um, the, the dangerous interceptions that you've been citing in the air and the sea um, is, is a partial consequence of a more assertive um, U.S. policy in the region that looks like it's offensive in nature, that's triggering China to feel that it needs to push back. You know, there are policy voices in China, too, that's saying, hey, China shouldn't be having appeasement right now. China should be pushing forward. And, and if we have these voices on both sides, 
that's going to lead to more escalations and pose greater dangers um, to the sons and daughters that you're referring to in, in American military families. So we'll say that, of course, it's important to maintain um, the current deployment, and it's also important to continue developing the, the uh, code for unplanned encounters at sea, um, cues to reduce exactly those incidents. Um, but the best way to enforce those protocols, to, to make sure these, the, the impactful incident doesn't happen again, to make sure the recent air-to-air -air interceptions don't happen again, is to implement these doctrines in a way that builds trust with China so, so that there's confidence building on both sides um, that, that when these crises occur, they don't escalate into something further. But, you know, just to follow up on the impeccable incident, this is 2009. You know, we do have this communication that goes back and forth between the naval vessel and China, and then the, we seem to have an understanding. And then from all the reports I've read, China puts wood in front of the impeccable. They have to come to an all stop. And this really put at risk our sailors. And so what do I tell those families? Um, and that incident, of course, is dangerous. Um, it's something that we don't want to see again. And we've been making progress. Um, since 2009, there has been progress made on cues, on the code for unplanned encounters at sea. And that's the direction we want to keep building. Um, to, to prevent another impactful incident from occurring again. So we agree that that was very bad. Um, but moving forward, we have to build confidence, we have to have confidence building measures on both sides to prevent that from happening again. And the last thing we want to see is a tit for tat escalation on both sides. And Christine, your, your thoughts on China's claims, or at least their de facto claims? So um, thank you for your question, Representative, Representative Gibson. As for the nine dashed line, um, the US is. Our hope with the multilateral forum is that we'll empower the region to solve their territorial disputes, including um, the Nine Dash Line. However, as far as the U.S.'s position on the Nine Dash Line, it's not something that the U.S. can stand to recognize and say is that this is like the pol what we should follow in the sea. Um, well, first, that endangers our allies, threatens our allies in the region, um, and the, as far as resource sharing in the exclusive economic zones, um, we cannot actually recognize the nine dash line as uh, like a legitimate uh, policy. Um, as far as that goes, um, the hope is that uh, the multilateral forum will be able to uh, work these out peacefully in uh, the future. Um, thanks guys, good presentation. I have uh, two questions. <coughs> um, Coley and Henry do a great job talking about Chinese insecurity um, and the, the sources of Chinese insecurity. But it seemed you suggested that underneath it all was military expenditures, right? That military spending was driving the security dilemma in the, in the region that was causing problems. But then you didn't talk about um, what the United States could do to contain military spending in the region. Obviously, the United States has a significant uh, military budget and it has allies that it might have leverage over. So you focus on uh, the rules-based order that could diffuse tension, but you didn't talk about what, you, what seems to be underneath it, which is the military spending. So question one is, where does military spending fit in uh, to your proposals, and how does that relate to the fact that many Americans wish the defense budget was higher? Second question, uh, so you need domestic support if you were going to decrease uh, military expenditures, but it, that does not appear to be forthcoming, or one might argue. Second one is, um, when does calculated restraint end? Under what circumstances do you guys move to a more assertive, forceful posture? In response to your question, sir, um, the first question, military expenditures, plays one part of the, one part of the piece. But in our policy prescription, um, in the four points for a military strategy, none of that requires reducing the U.S. expenditure. In fact, there's no way throughout we still advocate more, more capabilities to the region. It's just um, I, was that a rebalance, or was that additional capabilities on top of the present? Um, so, so we're continuing the buildup. We just want to continue at a, at a slower speed. The idea is, um, the idea is the redeployment of new warships should be slowed down, and then within the, within the region, while keeping the U.S. military capabilities, it's it's about the signals, about provocative patrols. It's about um, optics with, with partners, and it's about developing these codes for unexpected encounters at sea. So we're not advocating for the United States to draw back on its capabilities. Um, it, it's about signals, and I think Coley can talk more about expenditures. Um, but in response to your second question, um, which is where restraint ends, um, this one of the benefits of the strategy is it allows us to 
stand back and now see if China is really acting out of a defensive and security-based motives or whether it is being greedy and being a revisionist state. Um, because once we implement the strategy, then we look in the next year, does this reduce tensions? Um, or, or if China continues now, if we see a pattern of more aggressive actions, then the United States would be confident in saying that, you know what, we can now know for certain that China is a revisionist state. And of course, the United States isn't going to practice restraint forever if, if there's a pattern of aggressive action. And that will enable the United States to have legitimacy, to get more domestic support um, for a more assertive strategy um, in the Asia Pacific. So, um, Right. In the case of military spending, we see it more of a, a sign of the tensions rather than the cause itself. So the military spending comes out of these feelings of insecurity, of China feeling like it's being threatened by the international community, by the West. And then in response to that, you do see the Philippines and, and Vietnam feeling threatened, feeling the need to build up in response. So we don't see that. We see that military spending is something that can be scaled down by this increased trust, by cooperation and by the nations seeing that they are able to work together in this forum rather than needing to continue to build up to defend themselves. Great. Thank you for this very interesting, informative presentation. I have a question uh, really for anyone, but primarily I think for Henry and Coley. Uh, Henry, you mentioned that the likelihood of a Chinese invasion of Japan or the Philippines is very unlikely, um, and I would agree with that. I'm, also, I'm curious, though, for your... Um, thoughts on increased tensions between China and Taiwan and what you see first as the likelihood of any sort of increased tensions primarily given or in addition to the fact that we've seen a new Taiwanese government with cooler sentiments toward China, a lot of ambiguity around that relationship, also a lot of ambiguity around the U.S.-Taiwanese relationship. So two parts, what do you see as the likelihood of increased tensions between China and Taiwan? And secondly, what would, given your overall strategy, a U.S. response be if we do start to see increased assertiveness of China toward Taiwan, especially if we are, as you mentioned, looking to reduce that forward deployment of our military resources? Right. So on that first part, point, we don't see it as likely that there will be military conflict between China and Taiwan. So more recently, the shift in, in Chinese strategy has been towards a more economic integration. There's been a tremendous amount of investment on both sides, trade on both sides. And we see this as kind of negating the uh, some of the dangers of a more open military conf confrontation because there are now benefits on both sides to maintaining those relationships and, and continuing to improve them. When it comes to how Taiwan fits in the military picture, um, China does not have the capability and it won't have it in at least a decade to seize Taiwan and occupy it by military force. Um, in terms of a direct invasion, China lacks the amphibious lift um, that can get its forces there. In terms of a forcing blockade, China doesn't have the anti-submarine capabilities, um, so, so U.S. submarines can just um, stop any blockade. The greatest fear now, actually, is that um, with, with the more um, traditionally more pro-independence um, new party coming in power, the fear is actually that perhaps a change in Taiwan um, to the status quo might increase tension. So um, in terms of military strategy, <coughs> this is exactly what we want to be careful of, is to practice a dual deterrence. Not only do we want to deter China from changing the status quo, um, but also to deter a moral hazard on the part of, to part of Taiwan to increase tensions. And that's what's going to lead to a more peaceful solution. So I have a uh, two-part question. Really enjoyed the presentation. Um, the first is, you know, you say that China doesn't want to overthrow the international order. But to what extent do you agree that China wants to change the regional balance of power? I mean, you know, they've had this uh, century of humiliation, as you say. Um, it's very likely, I think, from many of the signs that we see, that China feels like the natural order of things is for China to be the regional hegemon. And so to what extent are your policies in line with that, number one? Um, number two, to what extent do you feel that you're saying not pull back from where before where we were in 2000 or previously, you're just saying don't do these new policies we're doing now, and yet your own timeline says those previous policies are what supposedly sparked Chinese nationalism. So is your solution really solving that issue that you're setting up in the first place? The final part, regional allies here, right? Let's say the United States pulls back or doesn't do this pivot to Asia. What's to keep Japan or these other states from kind of filling that gap? Because they feel very insecure here. And instead of having a unipolar or bipolar bilateral relationship between China and the US for security uh, dominance, instead you have a multipolar competition, which we often know is much more dangerous and much more competitive. So I'm interested to know what you guys think about that. Um, to address the first part about China wanting to change the regional balance of power, um, I do agree that there has been evidence that China is seeking to um, kind of 
restructure the way the, that the Asia Pacific region looks. For instance, the creation of the AIIB after the Asian Development Bank was already in place. Uh, China, I agree, like the Japanese led ADB was something that China wanted to kind of combat in, with the creation of the AIIB. However, the way our policies work in line with this is that we're giving China more of, first, uh, I'd say with the example of ratifying, ratifying the United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of Sea, like it, with us ratifying that, we're providing this example of a leader, like a world power, also playing by international rules. So, um, and kind of like what Coley had mentioned, this is something where we're kind of empowering China and leading by example so that they're more likely to see that a successful, powerful country also plays by international rules. And so to the restructuring of um, the regional balance of power, um, we want to, the, I think the US's role in this is kind of guiding it and facilitating it, but in a way that doesn't damage our interests and is not antagonistic to our allies' interests in the, nation, um, in the region. In response to the military relationship question, um, the United States would actually do a better job reassuring allies with a more prudent strategy. In other words, um, by, by having overextended commitments um, that in the, in the end the United States might not be able to keep um, putting things that aren't core interests and saying we're going, to, we're going to protect that. If the United States is eventually forced by, by a crisis to take a step back, that would undermine U.S. credibility more than just saying we're going to protect these core commitments to protecting the homeland of our allies, Philippines and Japan. And, and similarly, reducing patrols or um, having less aggressive um, optics with partnerships isn't going to threaten um, the homeland defense of Japan and the Philippines. So the idea that this is about signals, the less offensive signals to China isn't necessarily going to lead the Philippines and Japan to feel their homeland is being threatened. In response to your second question about how, about how to balance our previous policies with our current ones, um, we don't think that the pivot to Asia as a whole is incompatible with our uh, with our proposals. So the part that we we do think has been problematic has been the militarization. But as a whole, we think that it's completely correct that Asia is growing in importance. We do need to focus on improving our relations with the region. But we think we can do that cooperatively without building up our military. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I, I just wanted to make a, a comment briefly. Uh, appreciate the back and forth here you know what Joe was uh, mentioning here is as far as you know the real practicality of this is that's the kind of question you would get is you know what are the branches of calculated restraint and, and what are the indicators when we would have to look at moving in another direction because the nine dash line that I asked you is um, you know I want you to go back and take a look at what our op legal obligations are attendant to our bilateral treaty agreement with the Philippines and the Scarborough Shoal there in terms of, you know, China's, what we would view as rather assertive interpretation uh, and how that impacts the fishing industry in the Philippines and what are our obligations related to that. And that's why this question comes up on where the, where the end of, or, or how do we continue, if we end up going with calculated restraint, how do we ensure its success and then how do we branch off it if we, if we move in another direction. And finally, let me say this, that the comment you made on the bilat with China, I think, is the most significant of all of this. I have been saying this in Washington for some time uh, because, you know, we're dealing with uh, the symptom of the South China Sea. We also talk about North Korea and who has responsibilities to ensure their stability. And oftentimes, we, the international community points to China in that. We have concerns about intellectual property and with currency manipulation, and then there's the whole trade issue in the Pacific in general. And what I have said is, candidly, um, you know, I've been through the 5,000-page uh, draft of the Trans-Pacific Partner, actually final agreement of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I, I, I'm for trade. I'm not for that trade agreement. I think we've, we've really yielded too much, and I don't want to go into too much detail now. But I've now uh, come to the conclusion that um, our, our broader strategy was off track. I think rather than trying to outflank China with a Trans-Pacific Partnership, we have so much in common with China. We should sit down and do a bilateral that includes not only trade, but intellectual property, currency, North Korea, because China has uh, at least as much to lose in, in destabilizing this. And I think it would, it would be uh, helpful for all concerned, including us, that we would work out a bilateral. So I, I really uh, connected with that recommendation. Great. All right, well, join me again in thanking China's team.